Thomas Carlyle, the 4th of December 1795 to the 5th of February 1881, was a Scottish philosopher, satirical writer, essayist, translator, historian, mathematician, and teacher. Considered one of the most important social commentators of his time, he presented many lectures during his lifetime with certain acclaim in the Victorian era. One of those conferences resulted in his famous work on heroes, hero worship, and the heroic in history where he explains that the key role in history lies in the actions of the great man, claiming that the history of the world is but the biography of great men. A respected historian, his 1837 book The French Revolution, A History was the inspiration for Charles Dickens' 1859 novel A Tale of Two Cities, and remains popular today. Carlyle's 1836 Sartor Resartus is a notable philosophical novel. A great polemicist, Carlyle coined the term, the dismal science, for economics, in his essay Occasional Discourse on the Negro Question. He also wrote articles for the Edinburgh Encyclopedia, and his Occasional Discourse on the Negro Question 1849 remains controversial. Once a Christian, Carlyle lost his faith while attending the University of Edinburgh, later adopting a form of deism. In mathematics, he is known for the Carlyle Circle, a method used in quadratic equations and for developing ruler and compass constructions of regular polygons. <laughs> Early life and influences Carlyle was born in a Clefecken in Dumfrieshire. His parents determinedly afforded him an education at Annan Academy, Annan, where he was bullied and tormented so much that he left after three years. His father was a member of the Burger Secession Church. In early life, his family's and nation's strong Calvinist beliefs powerfully influenced the young man. After attending the University of Edinburgh, Carlyle became a mathematics teacher, first in Annan and then in Kirkcaldy, where he became close friends with the mystic Edward Irving. Confusingly, there is another Scottish Thomas Carlyle, born a few years later, connected to Irving via work with the Catholic Apostolic Church. In 1819-1821, Carlyle returned to the University of Edinburgh, where he suffered an intense crisis of faith and a conversion, which provided the material for Sartor Resartus, the tailor retailored which first brought him to the public's notice. Carlyle developed a painful stomach ailment, possibly gastric ulcers, that remained throughout his life and likely contributed to his reputation as a crotchety, argumentative, somewhat disagreeable personality. His prose style, famously cranky and occasionally savage, helped cement an air of irascibility. Carlyle's thinking became heavily influenced by German idealism, in particular the work of Johann Gottlieb Fichte. He established himself as an expert on German literature in a series of essays for Fraser's magazine, and by translating German works, notably Goethe's novel Wilhelm Meister's Lehrjahre. He also wrote A Life of Schiller. 1825. In 1826, Thomas Carlyle married fellow intellectual Jane Bailey Welsh, whom he had met through Edmund Irving during his period of German studies. In 1827, he applied for the chair of moral philosophy at St. Andrews University but was not appointed. A residence provided by Jane's estate was a house on Craigan Puttock, a farm in Dumfrieshire, Scotland. He often wrote about his life at Craigan Puttock, in particular, It is certain that for living and thinking in I have never since found in the world a place so favourable. Here Carlyle wrote some of his most distinguished essays, and began a lifelong friendship with the American essayist Ralph Waldo Emerson. In 1831, the Carlyles moved to London, settling initially in lodgings at 4 now 33 Ampton Street, King's Cross. In 1834, they moved to 5 now 24 Shane Row, Chelsea, which has since been preserved as a museum to Carlyle's memory. He became known as the Sage of Chelsea and a member of a literary circle which included the essayists Lee Hunt and John Stuart Mill. Here Carlyle wrote The French Revolution, a history two volumes, 1837, a historical study concentrating both on the oppression of the poor of France and on the horrors of the mob unleashed. The book was immediately successful. Writings <laughs> <laughs> Topic. Early writings By 1821, Carlyle abandoned the clergy as a career and focused on making a life as a writer. His first fiction was, "'Crothers and Johnson' 
one of several abortive attempts at writing a novel. Following his work on a translation of Goethe's Wilhelm Meister's apprenticeship, he came to distrust the form of the realistic novel and so worked on developing a new form of fiction. In addition to his essays on German literature, he branched out into wider-ranging commentary on modern culture in his influential essays Signs of the Times and Characteristics. In the latter, he laid down his abiding preference for the natural over the artificial. Thus, as we have an artificial poetry, and prize only the natural, so likewise we have an artificial morality, an artificial wisdom, an artificial society." Moreover, at this time he penned articles appraising the life and works of various poets and men of letters, including Goethe, Voltaire and Diderot. Sartor Resartus His first major work, Sartor Resartus, The Tailor Retailored, was begun as an article on the philosophy of clothes, and surprised him by growing into a full-length book. He wrote it in 1831 at his home, which his wife Jane provided for him from her estate, Craig and Puddock, and was intended to be a new kind of book, simultaneously factual and fictional, serious and satirical, speculative and historical. Ironically, it commented on its own formal structure while forcing the reader to confront the problem of where truth is to be found. Sartor Resartus was first serialized in Fraser's magazine from 1833 to 1834. The text presents itself as an unnamed editor's attempt to introduce the British public to Diogenes Teufelsdrock, a German philosopher of clothes, who is in fact a fictional creation of Carlyle's. The editor is struck with admiration, but for the most part is confounded by Teufelsdrock's outlandish philosophy, of which the editor translates choice selections. To try to make sense of Teufelsdrock's philosophy, the editor tries to piece together a biography, but with limited success. Underneath the German philosopher's seemingly ridiculous statements, there are mordant attacks on utilitarianism and the commercialization of British society. The fragmentary biography of Teufelsdrock that the editor recovers from a chaotic mass of documents reveals the philosopher's Carlyle's spiritual journey. He develops a contempt for the corrupt condition of modern life. He contemplates the everlasting no of refusal, comes to the center of indifference, and eventually embraces the everlasting yea. This voyage from denial to disengagement to volition would later be described as part of the existentialist awakening. Given the enigmatic nature of Sartor Resartus, it is not surprising that it first achieved little success. Its popularity developed over the next few years, and it was published in book form in Boston 1836, with a preface by Ralph Waldo Emerson, influencing the development of New England transcendentalism. The first English edition followed in 1838. <laughs> Everlasting Ye and No The Everlasting Ye is Carlyle's name in the book for the spirit of faith in God in an express attitude of clear, resolute, steady, and uncompromising antagonism to the Everlasting No, and the principle that there is no such thing as faith in God except in such antagonism against the spirit opposed to God. The Everlasting No is Carlyle's name for the spirit of unbelief in God, especially as it manifested itself in his own, or rather Teufelsdrock's, warfare against it, the spirit, which, as embodied in the Mephistopheles of Goethe, is forever denying, der Stets Vernen, the reality of the divine in the thoughts, the character, and the life of humanity, and has a malicious pleasure in scoffing at everything high and noble as hollow and void. In Sartor Resartus, the narrator moves from the everlasting no to the everlasting yea, but only through the center of indifference, a position of agnosticism and detachment. Only after reducing desires and certainty, aiming at a Buddha-like indifference, can the narrator realize affirmation? In some ways, this is similar to the contemporary philosopher Soren Kierkegaard's leap of faith in concluding unscientific postscript. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Worship of silence and sorrow. Based on Goethe's having described Christianity as the worship of sorrow and our highest religion for the Son of Man. Carlyle adds, interpreting this, "...there is no noble crown, well-worn or even ill-worn, but is a crown of thorns." The "...worship of silence," is Carlyle's name for the sacred respect for restraint in speech till 
Thought has silently matured itself, to hold one's tongue till some meaning lie behind to set it wagging." A doctrine which many misunderstand, almost willfully, it would seem, silence being to him the very womb out of which all great things are born. The French Revolution In 1834, Carlyle moved to London from Craig and Puttock and began to move among celebrated company. Within the United Kingdom, Carlyle's success was assured by the publication of his three-volume work The French Revolution, a history in 1837. After the completed manuscript of the first volume was accidentally burned by the philosopher John Stuart Mill's maid, Carlyle wrote the second and third volumes before rewriting the first from scratch. The resulting work had a passion new to historical writing. In a politically charged Europe, filled with fears and hopes of revolution, Carlyle's account of the motivations and urges that inspired the events in France seemed powerfully relevant. Carlyle's style of historical writing stressed the immediacy of action, often using the present tense, and incorporating many different perspectives on the changing events. For Carlyle, chaotic events demanded what he called heroes to take control over the competing forces erupting within society. While not denying the importance of economic and practical explanations for events, he saw these forces as spiritual the hopes and aspirations of people that took the form of ideas, and were often ossified into ideologies, formulas, or isms, as he called them. In Carlyle's view, only dynamic individuals could master events and direct these spiritual energies effectively. As soon as ideological formulas replaced heroic human action, society became dehumanized. Charles Dickens used Carlyle's work as a secondary source for the events of the French Revolution in his novel A Tale of Two Cities. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Heroes and hero worship. Like the opinions of many deep thinkers of the time, these ideas were influential on the development and rise of both socialism and fascism. Carlyle moved towards his later thinking during the 1840s, leading to a break with many old friends and allies, such as Mill and, to a lesser extent, Emerson. His belief in the importance of heroic leadership found form in the book on heroes, hero worship, and the heroic in history, in which he was seen to compare a wide range of different types of heroes, including Odin, Muhammad, Oliver Cromwell, Napoleon, William Shakespeare, Dante, Samuel Johnson, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Robert Burns, John Knox, and Martin Luther. These lectures of Carlyle's are regarded as an early and powerful formulation of the great man theory. The book was based on a course of lectures he had given. The French Revolution had brought Carlyle fame, but little money. His friends worked to set him on his feet by organizing courses of public lectures for him, drumming up an audience and selling guinea tickets. Carlyle did not like lecturing, but found that he could do it, and more importantly that it brought in some much-needed money. Between 1837 and 1840, Carlyle delivered four such courses of lectures. The final course was on heroes. From the notes he had prepared for this course, he wrote out his book, reproducing the curious effects of the spoken discourses, The Hero as Man of Letters, 1840. In books lies the soul of the whole past time, the articulate audible voice of the past, when the body and material substance of it has altogether vanished like a dream. A man lives by believing something, not by debating and arguing about many things. All that mankind has done, thought, gained or been, it is lying as in magic preservation in the pages of books. What we become depends on what we read after all of the professors have finished with us. The greatest university of all is a collection of books. The suffering man ought really to consume his own smoke, there is no good in emitting smoke till you have made it into fire. Adversity is sometimes hard upon a man, but for one man who can stand prosperity, there are a hundred that will stand adversity." Often shortened to, "...can't stand prosperity," as an unknown quote. Not what I have, but what I do, is my kingdom." Carlyle was one of the very few philosophers who witnessed the Industrial Revolution but still kept a non-materialistic view of the world. The book included lectures discussing people ranging from the field of religion through to literature and politics. 
The figures chosen for each lecture were presented by Carlyle as archetypal examples of individuals who, in their respective fields of endeavor, had dramatically impacted history in some way, for good or ill, and included such figures as Dante poet, Luther priest, and Napoleon king. Muhammad himself found a place in the book in the lecture titled, The Hero is Prophet. In his work, Carlyle outlined Muhammad as a Hegelian agent of reform, insisting on his sincerity and commenting, how one man single-handedly, could weld warring tribes and wandering Bedouin into a most powerful and civilized nation in less than two decades." His interpretation has been widely cited by Muslim scholars seeking Western support that Muhammad was one of the great men of history, Carlyle held, "...that great men should rule and that others should revere them," a view that for him was supported by a complex faith in history and evolutionary progress. Societies, like organisms, evolve throughout history, thrive for a time, but inevitably become weak and die out, giving place to a stronger, superior breed. Heroes are those who affirm this life process, accepting its cruelty as necessary and thus good. For them courage is a more valuable virtue than love, heroes are noblemen, not saints. The hero functions first as a pattern for others to imitate, and second as a creator, moving history forwards not backwards history being the biography of great men. Carlyle was among the first of his age to recognize that the death of God is in itself nothing to be happy about, unless man steps in and creates new values to replace the old. For Carlyle the hero should become the object of worship, the center of a new religion proclaiming humanity as the miracle of miracles, the only divinity we can know. For Carlyle's creed Bentley proposes the name heroic vitalism, a term embracing both a political theory, aristocratic radicalism, and a metaphysic, supernatural naturalism. The heroic vitalists feared that the recent trends toward democracy would hand over power to the ill-bred, uneducated, and immoral, whereas their belief in a transcendent force in nature directing itself onward and upward gave some hope that this overarching force would overrule in favor of the strong, intelligent, and noble. Nietzsche agreed with much of Carlyle's hero worship, transferring many qualities of the hero to his concept of the Superman. He believed that the hero should be revered, not for the good he has done for the people, but simply out of admiration for the marvelous. The hero justifies himself as a man chosen by destiny to be great. In the life struggle he is a conqueror, growing stronger through conflict. The hero is not ashamed of his strength, instead of the Christian virtues of meekness, humility and compassion, he abides by the beatitudes of heroic vitalism, courage, nobility, pride, and the right to rule. His slogan the good old rule, the simple plan, that he should keep who has the power, and he should take who can." For Carlyle, the hero was somewhat similar to Aristotle's magnanimous man, a person who flourished in the fullest sense. However, for Carlyle, unlike Aristotle, the world was filled with contradictions with which the hero had to deal. All heroes will be flawed. Their heroism lay in their creative energy in the face of these difficulties, not in their moral perfection. To sneer at such a person for their failings is the philosophy of those who seek comfort in the conventional. Carlyle called this valetism, from the expression, no man is a hero to his valet. <laughs> Past and present In 1843, he published his anti-democratic Past and Present, with its doctrine of ordered work. In it, he influentially called attention to what he termed the condition of England England is full of wealth supply for human want in every kind, yet England is dying of inanition. <laughs> Later work All these books were influential in their day, especially on writers such as Charles Dickens and John Ruskin. However, after the revolutions of 1848 and political agitations in the United Kingdom, Carlyle published a collection of essays entitled, Latter Day Pamphlets, 1850, in which he attacked democracy as an absurd social ideal, while equally condemning hereditary aristocratic leadership. Two of these essays, No. I. The Present Times, and No. Two. Model Prisons, were reviewed by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels in April 1850. Carlyle criticized hereditary aristocratic leadership as deadening. However, he criticized democracy as nonsensical, mocking the idea that objective truth could be discovered by weighing up the votes for it. 
Government should come from those most able to lead. But how such leaders were to be found, and how to follow their lead, was something Carlyle could not or would not clearly say. Marx and Engels agreed with Carlyle as far as his criticism of the hereditary aristocracy. However they criticized Carlyle's plan to use democracy to find the noblest and the other nobles that are to form the government by the ablest persons. Anthony Trollope for his part considered that in the pamphlets, the grain of sense is so smothered in a sack of the sheerest trash, he has one idea, a hatred of spoken and acted falsehood, and on this he harps through the whole eight pamphlets. A century later, Northrop Fry would similarly speak on Carlyle's tantrum prose rhetorical ectoplasm. In later writings, Carlyle sought to examine instances of heroic leadership in history. The letters and speeches of Oliver Cromwell 1845 presented a positive image of Cromwell, someone who attempted to weld order from the conflicting forces of reform in his own day. Carlyle sought to make Cromwell's words live in their own terms by quoting him directly, and then commenting on the significance of these words in the troubled context of the time. Again this was intended to make the past present to his readers, he is epic, still living, his essay, Occasional Discourse on the Negro Question, 1849, suggested that slavery should never have been abolished, or else replaced with serfdom. It had kept order, he argued, and forced work from people who would otherwise have been lazy and feckless, West Indian blacks are emancipated and, it appears, refuse to work. This, and Carlyle's support for the repressive measures of Governor Edward Eyre in Jamaica during the Morant Bay Rebellion, further alienated him from his old liberal allies. As governor of the colony, Eyre, fearful of an island-wide uprising, brutally suppressed the rebellion, and had many black peasants killed. Hundreds were flogged. He also authorized the execution of George William Gordon, a mixed-race colonial assemblyman who was suspected of involvement in the rebellion. These events created great controversy in Britain, resulting in demands for Eyre to be arrested and tried for murdering Gordon. John Stuart Mill organised the Jamaica Committee, which demanded his prosecution and included some well-known British liberal intellectuals such as John Bright, Charles Darwin, Frederick Harrison, Thomas Hughes, Thomas Henry Huxley, and Herbert Spencer. Carlyle set up rival Governor Eyre Defence and Aid Committee for the defence, arguing that Eyre had acted decisively to restore order. His supporters included John Ruskin, Charles Kingsley, Charles Dickens, Alfred Tennyson and John Tyndall. Twice Eyre was charged with murder, but the cases never proceeded. Similar hard-line views were expressed in Shooting Niagara, and after, written after the passing of the Electoral Reform Act of 1867 in which he reaffirmed his belief in wise leadership and wise followership, his disbelief in democracy and his hatred of all workmanship, from brickmaking to diplomacy, that was not genuine. <laughs> Frederick the Great His last major work was The Epic Life of Frederick the Great 1858-1865. In this Carlyle tried to show how a heroic leader can forge a state, and help create a new moral culture for a nation. For Carlyle, Frederick epitomized the transition from the liberal Enlightenment ideals of the 18th century to a new modern culture of spiritual dynamism embodied by Germany, its thought and its polity. The book is most famous for its vivid, arguably very biased, portrayal of Frederick's battles, in which Carlyle communicated his vision of almost overwhelming chaos mastered by leadership of genius. Carlyle struggled to write the book, calling it his 13 Years' War with Frederick. Some of the nicknames he came up with for the work included The Nightmare, The Minotaur, and The Unutterable Book. In 1852, he made his first trip to Germany to gather material, visiting the scenes of Frederick's battles and noting their topography. He made another trip to Germany to study battlefields in 1858. The work comprised six volumes, the first two volumes appeared in 1858, the third in 1862, the fourth in 1864 and the last two in 1865. Emerson considered it, "...infinitely the wittiest book that was ever written." James Russell Lowell pointed out some faults, but wrote, "...the figures of most historians seem like dolls stuffed with bran, whose whole substance runs out through any hole that criticism may tear in them, but Carlyle's are so real in comparison, that, if you prick them, they bleed." 
The work was studied as a textbook in the military academies of Germany. David Deitches, however, later concluded that since his idea of Frederick is not really borne out by the evidence, his mythopoeic effort partially fails. The effort involved in the writing of the book took its toll on Carlyle, who became increasingly depressed, and subject to various probably psychosomatic ailments. In 1853 he wrote a letter to his sister describing the construction of a small penthouse room over his home in Chelsea, intended as a soundproof writer's room. Unfortunately, the skylight made it the noisiest room in the house." The mixed reception to the book also contributed to Carlyle's decreased literary output. <laughs> <laughs> Last works Later writings were generally short essays, notably the Unsuccessful The Early Kings of Norway, a series on early medieval Norwegian warlords. Also an essay on the portraits of John Knox appeared in 1875, attempting to prove that the best-known portrait of John Knox did not depict the Scottish prelate. This was linked to Carlyle's long interest in historical portraiture, which had earlier fueled his project to found a gallery of national portraits, fulfilled by the creation of the National Portrait Gallery, London and the Scottish National Portrait Gallery. He was elected a foreign honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1878. London Library Carlyle was the chief instigator in the foundation of the London Library in 1841. He had become frustrated by the facilities available at the British Museum Library, where he was often unable to find a seat obliging him to perch on ladders, where he complained that the enforced close confinement with his fellow readers gave him a museum headache where the books were unavailable for loan, and where he found the library's collections of pamphlets and other material relating to the French Revolution and English Civil Wars inadequately catalogued. In particular, he developed an antipathy to the keeper of printed books, Anthony Panizzi despite the fact that Panizzi had allowed him many privileges not granted to other readers, and criticized him, as the "'respectable sub-librarian' in a footnote to an article published in the Westminster Review. Carlyle's eventual solution, with the support of a number of influential friends, was to call for the establishment of a private subscription library from which books could be borrowed. <laughs> private life Carlyle had a number of would-be romances before he married Jane Welsh, important as a literary figure in her own right. The most notable were with Margaret Gordon, a pupil of his friend Edward Irving. Even after he met Jane, he became enamoured of Kitty Kirkpatrick, the daughter of a British officer and an Indian princess. William Dalrymple, author of White Moogles, suggests that feelings were mutual, but social circumstances made the marriage impossible, as Carlyle was then poor. Both Margaret and Kitty have been suggested as the original of Blumen. Teufelsdrock's beloved, in Sartor Resartus, Thomas also had a friendship with writer Geraldine Jewsbury starting in 1840. During that year Jewsbury was going through a depressive state and also experiencing religious doubt. She wrote to Carlyle for guidance and also thanked him for his well-written essays. Eventually Carlyle invited Jewsbury out to Shane Row, where Carlyle and Jane resided. Jewsbury and Jane from then on had a tight friendship and Carlyle also helped Jewsbury get onto the English literary scene. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Marriage. Carlyle married Jane Welsh in 1826. He met Welsh through his friend and her tutor Edward Irving, with whom she came to have a mutual romantic although not intimate attraction. Welsh was the subject of Lee Hunt's charming poem Jenny kissed me. Their marriage proved to be one of the most famous, well-documented, and unhappy of literary unions. Over 9,000 letters between Carlyle and his wife have been published showing the couple had an affection for each other marred by frequent and angry quarrels. It was very good of God to let Carlyle and Mrs. Carlyle marry one another, and so make only two people miserable and not four. Carlyle became increasingly alienated from his wife. Carlyle's biographer James Anthony Frode published posthumously his opinion that the marriage remained unconsummated, although she had been an invalid for some time. His wife's sudden death in 1866 was unexpected and it greatly distressed Carlyle who was moved to write his highly self-critical, 
Reminiscences of Jane Welsh Carlyle, published posthumously. Topic: <laughs> Later Life. Carlyle was named Lord Rector of Edinburgh University. Three weeks after his inaugural address there, Jane died, and he partly retired from active society. His last years were spent at 24 Shane Row, then numbered 5, Chelsea, London SW3, which is now a National Trust property commemorating his life and works, but he always wished to return to Craig and Puttock. Death Upon Carlyle's death on 5 February 1881 in London interment in Westminster Abbey was offered but rejected due to his explicit wish to be buried beside his parents in a Clefecan. His final words were, so, this is death. Well. Biography <inaudible> 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 Carlyle would have preferred that no biography of him were written, but when he heard that his wishes would not be respected and several people were waiting for him to die before they published, he relented and supplied his friend James Anthony Frode with many of his and his wife's papers. Carlyle's essay about his wife was included in Reminiscences, published shortly after his death by Frode, who also published the letters and memorials of Jane Welsh Carlyle annotated by Carlyle himself. Frode's Life of Carlyle was published over 1882-84. The frankness of this book was unheard of by the usually respectful standards of 19th-century biographies of the period. Frode's work was attacked by Carlyle's family, especially his nephew, Alexander Carlyle and his niece, Margaret Aitken Carlyle. However, the biography in question was consistent with Carlyle's own conviction that the flaws of heroes should be openly discussed, without diminishing their achievements. Frode, who had been designated by Carlyle himself as his biographer to be, was acutely aware of this belief. Frode's defense of his decision, My Relations with Carlyle was published posthumously in 1903, including a reprint of Carlyle's 1873 will, in which Carlyle equivocated, "...express biography of me I had really rather that there should be none." Nevertheless, Carlyle in the will simultaneously and completely deferred to Frode's judgment on the matter, whose decision is to be taken as mine. Topic influence Thomas Carlyle is notable both for his continuation of older traditions of the Tory satirists of the 18th century in England and for forging a new tradition of Victorian-era criticism of progress known as sage writing. Sartor Resartus can be seen both as an extension of the chaotic, skeptical satires of Jonathan Swift and Lawrence Stern and as an enunciation of a new point of view on values. Carlyle is also important for helping to introduce German Romantic literature to Britain. Although Samuel Taylor Coleridge had also been a proponent of Schiller, Carlyle's efforts on behalf of Schiller and Goethe would bear fruit. The reputation of Carlyle's early work remained high during the 19th century, but declined in the 20th century. George Orwell called him, a master of belittlement. Even at his emptiest sneer, as when he said that Whitman thought he was a big man because he lived in a big country, the victim does seem to shrink a little. That, is the power of the orator, the man of phrases and adjectives, turned to a base use. However, Whitman himself described Carlyle as lighting up our 19th century with the light of a powerful, penetrating and perfectly honest intellect of the first class, and, never had political progressivism a foe it could more heartily respect. His reputation in Germany was always high, because of his promotion of German thought and his biography of Frederick the Great. Friedrich Nietzsche, whose ideas are comparable to Carlyle's in some respects, was dismissive of his moralism, calling him an absurd muddlehead in Beyond Good and Evil and regarded him as a thinker who failed to free himself from the very petty-mindedness he professed to condemn. Carlyle's distaste for democracy and his belief in charismatic leadership was appealing to Joseph Goebbels, who read Carlyle's biography of Frederick to Hitler during his last days in 1945. Many critics in the 20th century identified Carlyle as an influence on fascism and Nazism. Ernst Cassirer argued in The Myth of the State that Carlyle's hero worship contributed to 20th century ideas of political leadership that became part of fascist political ideology. Sartor Resartus has recently been recognized once more as a unique masterpiece, anticipating many major philosophical and cultural developments, from existentialism to postmodernism. It has been argued that his critique of ideological formulas in the French Revolution provides a good account of the ways in which revolutionary cultures turn into repressive dogmatisms. 
Essentially a romantic, Carlyle attempted to reconcile romantic affirmations of feeling and freedom with respect for historical and political fact. Many believe that he was always more attracted to the idea of heroic struggle itself, than to any specific goal for which the struggle was being made. However, Carlyle's belief in the continued use to humanity of the hero, or great man, is stated succinctly at the end of his essay on Muhammad in On Heroes, Hero Worship and the Heroic in History, in which he concludes that, the great man was always as lightning out of heaven, the rest of men waited for him like fuel, and then they too would flame, a bust of Carlyle is in the Hall of Heroes of the National Wallace Monument in Stirling. Works. 1829 Signs of the Times. The Victorian Web. 1833-34 Sartor Resartus. Project Gutenberg. 1837 The French Revolution, A History. Project Gutenberg. 1840 Chartism. Google Books. 1841 On Heroes, Hero Worship, and the Heroic in History. Project Gutenberg. 1843 Past and Present. Project Gutenberg 1845 Oliver Cromwell's Letters and Speeches, with Elucidations, ed. Thomas Carlyle, three-volume, often reprinted, online version. Another online version 1849 Occasional Discourse on the Negro Question. Fraser's Magazine, anonymous, online text 1850 Latter-day Pamphlets. Project Gutenberg 1851 The Life of John Sterling. Project Gutenberg 1858 History of Friedrich II of Prussia. Index to Project Gutenberg texts 1867 Shooting Niagara, and after. Online text 1875 The Early Kings of Norway. Project Gutenberg 1882 Reminiscences of My Irish Journey in 1849. Online text 1892 Lectures on the History of Literature. There are several published, collected works of Carlyle. Unauthorized Lifetime Editions. Thomas's Carlyle's Ausgewalt Schriften, 1855 56, Leipzig. Translations by A. Kretschmer. Abandoned after six vols. Authorized Lifetime Editions. Uniform Edition, Chapman and Hall, 16 vols, 1857 58. Library edition, Chapman and Hall, 34 vols, 30 vols 1869 to 71, three additional vols added 1871 and one more 1875. The most lavish lifetime edition, it sold for 6 to 9 shillings per volume or 15 pounds the set. People's edition, Chapman and Hall, 39 vols, 37 vols 1871 to 74, with two extra volumes added in 1874 and 1878. Carlyle insisted the price be kept to two shillings per volume. Cabinet edition, Chapman and Hall, 37 vols in 18, 1874 printed from the plates of the People's edition posthumous editions Centennial edition, Chapman and Hall, 30 volume, 1896-99 with reprints to at least 1907. Introductions by Henry Duff Trail. The text is based on the People's edition, and it is used by many scholars as the standard edition of Carroll's works. Norman and Charlotte Strauss edition, originally the California Carlyle edition, University of California Press, 1993-2006. Only four volumes were issued. On Heroes. 1993. Sartor Resartus. 2000. Historical Essays. 2003. And. Past and Present. 2006. Despite being incomplete, it is the only critical edition of some of Carlyle's works. Definitions Carlyle had quite a few unusual definitions at hand, which were collected by the Nuttall Encyclopedia. Some include Center of immensities An expression of Carlyle's to signify that wherever anyone is, he is in touch with the whole universe of being, and as, if he knew it, as near the heart of it there is anywhere else he can be. Eleutheromania A mania or frantic zeal for freedom. Gigman Carlyle's name for a man who prides himself on, and pays all respect to, respectability. 
It is derived from a definition once given in a court of justice by a witness who, having described a person as respectable, was asked by the judge in the case what he meant by the word, one that keeps a gig, was the answer. Carlyle also refers to gigmanity at large. Hallowed fire An expression of Carlyle's in definition of Christianity, at its rise and spread, as sacred, and kindling what was sacred and divine in man's soul, and burning up all that was not. Mites and rights The Carlyle doctrine that rights are nothing till they have realized and established themselves as mites, they are rights first only then. Pig philosophy the name given by Carlyle in his latter-day pamphlets, in the one on Jesuitism, to the widespread philosophy of the time, which regarded the human being as a mere creature of appetite instead of a creature of God endowed with a soul, as having no nobler idea of well-being than the gratification of desire, that his only heaven, and the reverse of it his hell. Plugston of Undershot Carlyle's name for a «captain of industry» or member of the manufacturing class. Present time Defined by Carlyle as, "...the youngest born of eternity, child and heir of all the past times, with their good and evil, and parent of all the future with new questions and significance." On the right or wrong understanding of which depend the issues of life or death to us all, the Sphinx riddle given to all of us to read as we would live and not die. Prinzorob the stealing of the princes Name given to an attempt to satisfy a private grudge of his, on the part of Kunz von Kaufungen to carry off, on the night of 7 July 1455, two Saxon princes from the castle of Altenburg, in which he was defeated by apprehension at the hands of a collier named Schmidt, through whom he was handed over to justice and beheaded. See Carlyle's account of this in his Miscellanies. Printed paper Carlyle's satirical name for the literature of France prior to the Revolution. Progress of the Species magazines Carlyle's name for the literature of the day which does nothing to help the progress in question, but keeps idly boasting of the fact, taking all the credit to itself, like French poet Jean de La Fontaine's fly on the axle of the careening chariot soliloquizing, What a dust I raise! Sourtag i.e. Levin, an imaginary authority alive to the celestial infernal fermentation that goes on in the world, who has an eye specially to the evil elements at work, and to whose opinion Carlyle frequently appeals in his condemnatory verdict on sublunary things. The conflux of eternities Carlyle's expressive phrase for time, as in every moment of it a center in which all the forces to and from eternity meet and unite, so that by no past and no future can we be brought nearer to eternity than where we at any moment of time are, the present time, the youngest born of eternity, being the child and heir of all the past times with their good and evil, and the parent of all the future. By the import of which see Matt, XVI. 27. It is accordingly the first and most sacred duty of every successive age, and especially the leaders of it, to know and lay to heart as the only link by which eternity lays hold of it, and it of eternity. See also Annales School and Nouvelle Histoire Curtis Yarvin Max Weber's Charismatic Authority Philosophy of history Ubermensch Whig history Famous Scots series Historiography of the French Revolution Topic. Notes Topic Bibliography Chandler, Alice Carlyle and the Medievalism of the North, in, Medievalism in the Modern World Essays in Honor of Leslie J. Workman. Ed. Richard Utz and Tom Shippey. Turnhout, Breppels, pp. 173-191. Eekler, A. A. Puritan Temper and Transcendental Faith. Carlyle's Literary Vision. Columbus, Ohio, Ohio State University Press. McDougall, Hugh A. Racial Myth in English History, Trojans, Teutons, and Anglo-Saxons. Montreal, Harvest House and University Press of New England. Rowe, Frederick William 1921. The Social Philosophy of Carlyle and Ruskin. New York, Harcourt, Brace and Company. Waring, Walter 1978. Thomas Carlyle. Boston, Twain Publishers. Topic further reading Caird, Edward 1892. 
The Genius of Carlyle, in Essays on Literature and Philosophy, Vol. I, Glasgow, James McClehos and Sons, pp. 230-267. Cobbin, Alfred 1963. Carlyle's French Revolution, History, Vol. 48, No. 164, pp. 306-316. Cumming, Mark 1988. A Disimprisoned Epic, Form and Vision in Carlyle's French Revolution. University of Pennsylvania Press. Harold, Charles Frederick 1934. Carlyle and German Thought, 1819-1834. New Haven, Yale University Press. Kaplan, Fred 1983. Thomas Carlyle, A Biography. Berkeley, University of California Press. Muller, Max 1886. Goethe and Carlyle. The Contemporary Review, Vol. XLIX, pp. 772-793. Lecky, W. E. H. 1891. Carlyle's Message to His Age. The Contemporary Review, Vol. LX, pp. 521-528. Norton, Charles Eliot 1886. Recollections of Carlyle. The New Princeton Review, Vol. 2, No. 4, pp. 1-19. Rigney, Anne 1996. The Untenanted Places of the Past, Thomas Carlyle and the Varieties of Historical Ignorance, History and Theory, Vol. 35, No. 3, pp. 338-357. Rosenberg, John D. 1985. Carlyle and the Burden of History. Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard University Press. Rosenberg, Philip 1974. The Seventh Hero. Thomas Carlyle and the Theory of Radical Activism. Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard University Press. Stephen, James Fitzjames 1865. Mr. Carlyle, Fraser's Magazine, Vol. LXXII, pp. 778-810. Simons, Julian 1952. Thomas Carlyle, The Life and Ideas of a Prophet. New York, Oxford University Press. Vonden Bosch, Chris 1991. Carlyle and the Search for Authority. Columbus, Ohio State University Press. Wellek, René 1944. Carlyle in the Philosophy of History, Philological Quarterly, Vol. 23, No. 1, pp. 55-76. Topic external links Thomas Carlyle's Birthplace, National Trust for Scotland Thomas and Jane Carlyle's Craig and Puttock The official site works by Thomas Carlyle at Project Gutenberg Works by or about Thomas Carlyle at Internet Archive Works by Thomas Carlyle at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks Poems by Thomas Carlyle at PoetryFoundation.org The Carlyle Letters Online Archival material relating to Thomas Carlyle. UK National Archives a Guide to the Thomas Carlyle Collection at the Beinock Rare Book and Manuscript Library Portraits of Thomas Carlyle at the National Portrait Gallery, London The Eclefecan Carlyle Society The Green Snake and the Beautiful Lily, Thomas Carlyle's Translation 1832 from the German of Goethe's Marchen or Das Marchen.